In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Please be seated. Well, welcome to the beginning of your Holy Lent. I hope it is a meaningful one for, for all of you. Um, I just have a few remarks and then we'll continue with the service. We're not going to do the normal forum time, so if you're thinking that you had to store up observations to make, you're, you're off the hook tonight. Um, <clears throat> There was a time when it was a, it was a part of not just people who were extra religious, but a part of very ordinary people's lives to do fasting and other forms of observance during holy seasons, such as especially Lent. Everyone did it in the Middle Ages when Christendom was ascendant and everyone went to church, or so we assume. Uh, during that time period, all you had to do is basically say, this is your holy obligation, this is what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to fast, and you more or less would. Well, the decline of all that, the church has changed its narrative, and, and now you often hear people frame the disciplines of, of Lent and, and of fasting in terms of what's good for you. You No longer are you doing it because you're supposed to, now you do it because it's good for you. And one of the, uh, the signs of that is that a lot of people give up things that are bad for them, like they, they maybe give up smoking for Lent or chocolate, or they go on a diet, or maybe they take something up, they start exercising, or reading a book that they know they really should read anyway, but they're, they're going to go ahead and read that book, and they're going to take on that discipline. But I think that has limitations, too. I want to suggest that we do these things that we do in Lent, not because they are our duty necessarily, or because they're good for us, that they'll realize some reward for us in this life. I want to suggest that we do it because it's good for God. Because when we do these things, we are advancing God's kingdom, God's agenda, not necessarily our own. Yeah, sure, giving up chocolate or alcohol or going on a diet is probably good for you, and you may receive some benefit from it, but I don't think you should do it because of that. I think you should do it because in the Christian hope we proclaim something much greater than ourselves or anything that we might hope to realize in the rewards of this life. Not even the happiness of a, of a wonderful family or, or having a health or a long life or any of those things, or even wisdom can compare to the glory that we expect to receive from our Father in heaven who desires for us benefits that are not limited by the limitations of this world, of time, of space, of, of any of that stuff. Just as the church has become shy about proclaiming sin or sinfulness or suggesting that people have done anything wrong, we've also become shy about proclaiming the hope that is within us, which is far more than just a therapeutic God. It's far more than that. It is a God who promises life that is eternal. What's interesting is that people who are on uh, closer to that uh, notion of eternity, either because they themselves are sick or because they live in a place where they are very vulnerable to, to the dangers this world has to offer, for whatever reason, those are the vulnerable people who have, for some reason, a much easier time accepting the fullness of the gospel. It's much harder for the comfortable, for those of us in the prime of our lives who enjoy the riches of this world and all that it can offer. It's much harder for us to see that heaven has anything in store for us. There's a great prayer that goes something like, God, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Maybe Lent is an opportunity to visit a little bit of that infliction upon ourselves through small acts of piety and devotion and, and sufferance. You know, maybe just simply giving something up for Lent somehow gets us in touch a little bit with our own mortality. Because the truth is what Ash Wednesday takes on, what Lent takes on, is nothing less than the very existential mystery of death. This is nothing less than the response of the Christian people to that darkest of mysteries. What we proclaim when we take those ashes onto our foreheads is that we are not afraid to go there. In our spirituality, in our minds, in our imaginations, we're not afraid to ponder our own deaths, to put it in front of us. We do that because we have something much, much greater on the other side of it awaiting us. The Easter hope. The Paschal victory which we'll celebrate 46 days from now on Easter that glorious moment when we break out the candy and put on the white dresses and enjoy the spring which will finally have arrived. Please, God, please. <laughs> There's a little boy in a viral clip on YouTube that he's shoveling snow with a little plastic shovel and he gets exasperated and at a certain point he throws down the shovel. He stares up at the sky and he says, Jesus, make it warm. <laughs> Isn't that what Lent is for us? That moment of Jesus, make it warm. And he will. You'll see. Easter is coming, people. But in the meantime, we have the hard work of this winter to finish. 
sidewalks to shovel, prayers to make, ashes to take on our foreheads, and the reality of death to stare in the face. But the hope that I want you to hold in your hearts as we go through this last waning days of winter is that this is not the end, that this winter is not eternal, that the sun will come, the Easter victory will be there for us on the other side of our contemplations. And that's what I hope you take with us this Lent. Amen.